Hey guys, thanks for joining us. We have a lovely message prepared for you. But just before we go into that, we just like to remind you that if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so by going to our website, www.lpmchurch.ie and click the giving button. Thank you and enjoy the message. Hey guys, it's such a privilege to be here uh, another morning uh, preaching to you guys. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Daniel. Uh, I am the pastor's kid, the senior pastor's kid. Um, and I have something to say to those that weren't here two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago, I forgot I was preaching, and it was a very interesting preaching. <laughs> but I didn't forget this time. So I, you might have said, you might say that I may be overprepared just to make up for you know, the last, uh, the, the last preaching, but I, I, really wanna, I really wanted to give you guys something, and I wanted to give you guys something that you probably haven't heard, not in the way that I'm going to be talking about it anyway, uh, and I want us to open our Bibles, I brought my Bible today, and if we can, guys, if you have your Bibles, open them in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. We're going to be reading from this passage. I just want to read a few verses. I will obviously talk about the Bible. Do you guys talk about the Bible here? <laughs> I will be talking about the Bible, but in terms of Bible reading, I pray that you take down some notes so that you can look back on it later because we will not be taking much time going through the Bible. So if you open it in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, if you have it open, let's go. I'm reading in the NIV. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a, such a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, uh, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Amen. Hey Amen, that's some, that's some good things. Today I'm going to be preaching around a team, and the title of my message is really interesting. You have probably never heard a message. I don't think there's ever had, uh, there's ever been a message with this title. I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> the title of my message today, and this will make sense to you in a bit, is Coffee and Toast. The title of my message today is Coffee and Toast. So if you're taking down notes, put down Coffee and Toast. Now, I want to tell you guys a story. This happened to me this past week, and it was something that I was outraged about. So I went to Fin Electrical, which is the store over there, and I'm going to Choose my words very carefully because John Finn is the landlord of this place. So I will, uh, yeah, let's go. Okay. <laughs> so I went to Finn Electrical because um, right at the window, they have this kettle and they have this four slice toaster. And they are like the most beautiful kettle and toaster I have ever seen. Okay. It was just great. And okay, here's the thing, guys. All right. I got married. So, you know. Kettles and toasters excite me, okay? That's, that's what it is. <laughs> so uh, I was going by, and I saw the kettle and the toaster, and I was like, man, that, that is like, I, I was talking to Chris, my wife, and I was like, man, that is a really good kettle and, and, and toaster. And our kettle is about to go. It doesn't heat up the water all the way, so we were thinking, all right, we need, we need a replacement. Um, and so on Tuesday... Um, I was home, I wasn't at work, and, and I decided, you know what, this is the perfect time for me to go to Fin Electrical to see the price on the kettle and the toaster. And so I went to Fin Electrical and, you know, casually walk in, pretend that you're, 
you know, going to buy something that you, you know, that you have money, but in fact, you don't really, you're just there to kind of um, window shop. But uh, I went in and I looked at the price tag. So the kettle went for 119 and 99 cents, 120 euro pretty much. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> and then I looked at the toaster and uh, I looked at the toaster and it was uh, 129 euros and 99 cents. And I was like, okay, I don't think we're going to get this. I, I don't care how good looking a kettle and a toaster is, even if it is a four slice toaster, okay? It still doesn't make up for the fact that it is like 250 euro, both of them. I just, it's 250 euro. Like, I got money, but not that much. <laughs> so, basically, I was so disappointed. I was expecting it to be at around 100 euro, the set, uh, because it is some, like, it's a good brand. It's, 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 it's high quality, and it just looked awesome. So I was like, yeah, it's probably like 100 euro, maybe 100 and a bit, 250. So, but I could not be conformed to the price of the, of the four slice toaster and the kettle. So I took down the model and as I was going home, I looked it up on Amazon. And when I looked it up on Amazon, I was absolutely outraged because on Amazon, the set of the toaster and the kettle go for 73 pounds and free shipping. 73 pounds. And I was like, this is, on, this is less than 100 euro, like, less than what I was thinking. And then Finn Electrical is 250. Now, Finn Electrical is a great store. You guys should totally check it out. Again, he's our landlord, so I should say it. It's right over there at the corner. But anyway, it's so overpriced. It is over. Price. And I was so outraged. I sent a message on our family group chat and I was like, guys, here's what happened to me. And I told them the entire story. And as I was sending the messages and as, as I was talking to, I think Anna answered and my mom as well. And as I was talking, I, I actually, I had an idea. I was like, I can use this. I can, I can use them. And I said, mom, I think I got my sermon illustration for Sunday. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is definitely what it is. So today, this morning, and this is why it's coffee and tea uh, and toast, because, you know, you usually make coffee with a kettle and toast with a toaster. But today, I want to talk to you about overpricing, overpriced. So if you didn't like the title Coffee and Toast, my pure original title, you can, you can title the message Overpriced. I want to talk about a few things that we overprice. I want to talk about a few things that we underprice. And when I say overpricing, I really mean overvaluing or undervaluing because price is only a measure of value in business. The, the bigger the value of something, the bigger the price on it. And so when I say overpriced, I really do mean overvaluing because there are things in this life that you don't really put a price to, but you definitely put a value to. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. So the first point that I want to talk to you about and something that I think we overprice is we overprice our difficulties. We overvalue our difficulties. You see, we overprice what it takes to get out of the situation that we are in. We give it too much value. We think that there is no possible way. And it's funny because it's really about perspective. I find that myself, I don't know about you guys, but I might be a little bit more of a sinner than you guys are, but I feel that whenever I go through a difficult situation, a struggle, a place where I would, like, I would not like to be in, whenever I go through something like that and I get out on the other side, I feel like when I look back, I feel like, yeah, maybe, maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought. Maybe I overpriced it, I over valued, I overestimated the situation and the difficulty that I was in. Because when you're in the situation, because it is personal and it is to you, you tend to overprice the difficulty and the situation that you are in, thinking, oh no, this is the end. A prime example of this, all right? I didn't even take this down on my notes. I just thought of it. It's how it goes. The Holy Spirit is speaking. <laughs> take a teenager, okay? Where's Caleb? 
Hey, Caleb. Take, take, take Caleb. <laughs> okay, don't take Caleb. Take a teenager, right? Let's say that uh, there are teenagers, um, spe especially teenagers nowadays, right? They're dating, and then they break up. And they're like 14 or 15, right? <laughs> and they're crying, and they're just like, this is the end, and my life is over, or I am never going to be happy again. And you're thinking to yourself, obviously, as a parent, you're like, oh, don't worry, little Johnny, you know, you'll be okay. But inside, you're kind of thinking, come on, come on, you're like 14. What are you doing? Like, you're crying over a boy, you're crying over a girl. Like, it's not the end of your life. Trust me, next week, you'll be fine, you know? Uh, but as adults, we do the exact same thing. We do the exact same thing. And I, 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 the reason why I, I picked this passage is because I wanted, to, I wanted to give you a little bit of context into, into what is happening right now. Paul and Silas are in Philippi. We're at this passage. We are looking at the beginning of the church of Philippians. The book of Philippians, the letter that was written to the church in Philippi. So Paul and Silas are in Philippi. And they are preaching the gospel. And they're doing the Lord's work. And they're there and they're preaching day and night. Helping people, loving people, saving people, baptizing people. But the thing is, there's this girl who can see the future. That the Bible tells us that it's just an evil spirit inside of her. And she starts following Paul and Silas around. And, and she starts disturbing them. And at one point, Paul just, I mean... I'm done with this. I'm done with this. And so he rebukes the spirit out of her. And she returns to normal, but loses her ability to see the future. And this is a problem. This is a problem because there was a lot of businessmen who made a profit out of her gift. And so because of that, they got really, really angry at Paul and Silas. And they decided to go to the authorities and make up a bunch of lies. Saying that these guys are Jews. And they are here. And they're trying to start a riot. And they're trying to start trouble. We should arrest them. And that is what they did. They arrested Paul and Silas. Put them into prison. But not before they beat them up with rods. rods. The Bible says they were flogged. They were beaten and thrown into prison. Now picture this, right? I know that it's really, really difficult when we have a hard time, a hard situation, a difficulty, when we are hurting. But imagine that you are going through that because you were doing everything right. Because you were doing everything right. Paul and Silas were doing everything right. They were preaching the gospel. They were doing what God had called them to do. They were in the place that God had called them to be. And you would think that God would protect them. And you would think that God would be with them. But they are thrown in prison. Wasn't God meant to protect them? But you see, I want to say that not overpricing pricing the situation that you are in. It's not taking away the value of the situation that you are in. Not overpricing the situation that you are in does not take away the value of the pain, of the struggle, of the difficulty that you are in right now. You see, I know it hurts. When your kids are going down a path that you did not teach them to. You spent years trying to teach them the right path and they are going the wrong path. I know it hurts when you've studied and you've tried hard but you're still failing in school. I know it's hard when you were expecting that baby but then all of a sudden in a moment he's not coming anymore. I know it hurts. And not overpricing that situation does not mean that you are in denial does not mean that what you're going through is not happening, does not mean that it doesn't matter. Because I feel that, the, that some, some churches, obviously not ours, but, <laughs> but some churches, some people are, are so composed that they would feel, they would act as if the pain and struggle of, that someone is going to, true, especially if it's because of their sin, they think, oh, you know, they should just get their act together. Oh, you know, they shouldn't have done that. Oh, you know, it doesn't really matter. They'll get through it. 
There is value in the situation that you are in. It is important the situation that you are in. So I'm not preaching here saying that what you're going through or what you will go through does not matter, doesn't have any value. I want to make that clear. You see, Paul and Silas, they were in prison. And they did not overprice or overvalue the situation that they were in. But it's not like they were in denial on the place that they were in, on the situation that they were in. And you see, the thing is, the situation that you're going through right now, I want you to know that in the past, you have gone through thick and thin, and you have come out on the other end. And you can be sure that God was with you, and God was acting and moving. He, God was up to something, even if it looked like he wasn't. Because you see, one day God came as a man, and he came down to the earth, and he lived a life filled with difficulties just like yours. And, so that, uh, and he died on the cross so that today you could be with him forever and ever. And so you can be rest assured that there isn't a difficulty, there isn't a situation that is going to separate his love and his presence from you Amen. even if it looks like it even if it's quiet he won't fail Amen. you know we read this passage and we think that we think that this is a great passage it is so well known because it is what we love a great earthquake shook the foundations of the prison. It broke down the, sh the chains. The gates swing wide open. The people are free. Everyone is rejoicing. But there is a key word that you probably missed while we were reading that passage. You want to read it again? Acts chapter 16, verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Did you see it? It says about midnight. Now, I believe in a God that is all-powerful, and I believe in a God that has all the power to come in into our situation and change our situation. So why is it that Paul and Silas are in prison in the first place? Couldn't God just do a miracle and turn them invisible, teleport them into another place? Couldn't God provide a way for them to escape? Or, or why are they there until Midnight, until it's dark. They've been there all day, waiting. No answer. God, where are you? Praying away, hoping. God, where are you? And midnight comes along, and it's dark. It's not like nowadays where prisons are like little lit up, and you have your little bed. No, it was stone, it was cold, and it was dark. Paul and Silas were beaten, and they were thrown in prison, and they were there, until midnight. And we know what happens next, but they did not. They were there until midnight. And the thing is, why doesn't God, and I think this is a big question, and obviously the answer is going to be different for every situation, but why doesn't God come in in my situation and come and save me and come and help me and change my situation and change what I'm going through? I believe, and this is a general answer. I cannot speak into specifically your situation, but understand that the times that we learn the most are the hardest times. It's not when life is going good. It's not when we are having fun. It's not when the gates swing right op wide open and the chains fall, but it's actually midnight. It's the lead up to midnight that would shape our character and turn us into pe the people that God has called us to be. And we cannot overprice our situation. Because when we realize that God is with us and that he will never fail, and even though there is a lead up to midnight and we're still in prison, we're still beaten, we're still down, we can always say in the words of Hill's song, and I love this song, it says, even when my strength is lost, I'll praise you. Even when I have no song to sing, I'll praise you. And even when it's hard to find the words, I cannot find the words louder than I will sing your praise. 
louder than I will sing your praise. Because no matter what I'm going through, you are still God. No matter what I'm going through, you're still in the throne. And I can hold on and I can be with you. Because even though it's midnight, there comes a time when God comes true. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you see, if you, if you underprice the influence that God has in your life and in your situation, and you overprice the difficulties that you are in, it will seem like your difficulties are mountains and barriers that you could not possibly climb and go through. And it will seem that God is a God that is distant and doesn't care. It's all about attention. You see, attention provides access. Whatever has your attention has access into your life, has access to influence you. Whoever and whatever has your attention. So where is your attention? Is it on God, his power, his influence, his perfect track record of never failing, or is it on the situation that you're in? Don't take away the value of the difficulty, but certainly don't give it your attention. Amen? Amen. Amen. The next thing I would like to talk about is underpricing our love for others. We underprice our love for others. We think that lo loving is no big thing. You know, when, when, when God commands us to love one another, we think, yeah, you know, I'm doing that. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not doing anything. I welcome people. But I truly believe that when we start to truly live the commandment that God gave to love one another, particularly Christians, because that is how other people will know us. The Bible says it. It will be true the love that we have for one another. That is what defines a Christian. When I believe that when we truly start to live that out, the church will be changed upside down. I kid you not. I believe that when we start giving a genuine, warm welcome to people, things are going to change. I believe that when we are genuinely interested in people and their lives, things are going to change. I believe that when we start smiling more to people, that things are going to change. I believe that when we go out of our way to help people, things are going to change. I believe that when we, when we encourage more than we criticize, things are going to change. The world is not ready for the love of God. It's not. And it's our job to take it to the world. To take it to the world. Jesus has done it all. We're just the messengers. So what are you going to do? Are you going to be composed and cold? Because that's, that is the cycle that Christians, that it's really dangerous for Christians to fall into. You forget how you were. You forget your salvation. You forget that other people were in the same situation as you before Christ. Because it's been so long since, since you've been saved. It's been so long since, you, since you've been a Christian that you forget that there are people out there that go through struggles that you might think is, are stupid because you're a Christian and you have the truth and you have God and you can hold on. But there are people out there that do not have our hope. And so it is very easy for us to be composed. We're good. We're Christians. I am a Christian. I read my Bible. I pray every single day. I do everything right. And we fall into the trap of forgetting that people need love. So, so much love. We forget that a warm welcome, a just hello, remembering the person's name, can change a person's life forever. And we underprice that love. We undervalue that love for others. And that's exactly what Paul did with the jailer. I don't know about you, but if I was Paul, and I may be like a real sinner up here, but if I was Paul and things had just happened what the, the way that they happened, chains break loose, gates swing wide open, everyone is free, I would get the heck out of Dodge. Like, I literally would run. I was in prison. God saved me. Praise God. Let's go. But it's so interesting that Paul does, does the exact opposite. I... I don't know. This is not in the Bible. This is how I see it. I, Silas was probably running. He's like, Paul, what are you doing? No, man, I got to say, Paul, what are you doing? And Paul, he loves the jailer because Paul wasn't thinking of himself and of his life and of his salvation and his freedom. He was like, what about the jailer? 
Because he doesn't know any better. Yes, he may have beaten us. He may have imprisoned us. He was there to guard us. But he doesn't know any better. He doesn't know any better. And so he goes, and, and the jailer was about to kill himself because at the time, it's not like you lost your job if the prisoners escaped. You lost your life. And probably not just you, but your family. And so it was an honorable thing for you to just fall on your own sword. It's the Roman way. And the jailer was about to kill himself. And Paul says, no, stop. We're all here. Paul gathered up the prisoners who probably didn't even know Jesus. And they don't even know why Paul is doing that. But he was able to convince them to stay. And he saved the jailer's life. Because he loved them. Because he loved them when nobody else would. He loved the jailer. Another thing that we underprice is we underprice God's grace. We underprice God's grace. Uh, I'm going to talk about someone. I'm not going to go deep into it, especially because Alistair mentioned him uh, last Sunday. I'm going to talk about Zacchaeus, but just real quick. You probably have heard of it in Sunday school if you've been around since you were a kid. If you've probably heard of him in a preaching or two if you've been in the church scene for a bit. But if you don't know him, let me, let me break it down for you, all right? I like to call him the Zacche Zacchaeus the gangster. Zacchaeus the gangster, because he truly was a bit of a gangster, all right? The Bible calls him a tax collector, uh, but the Bible version, according to Daniel, says the gangster. <laughs> and here's, here's why. You see, Zacchaeus was a tax collector for the Roman Empire. People hated, I mean, people hate tax collectors, right? Uh, you know, nowadays we don't really have people that do it. We just get, you know, our wages sliced uh, when we get paid, but... At the time, it was people, and people would go door to door collecting tax. But Zacchaeus, you see, for a tax collector to really have any real income, he would have to overcharge people. And the thing is, right, it wasn't like today where everything is, is a bit super, supervised. It was much more primitive. It was, it was much more uh, simple. And so tax collectors overcharged people because the extra money that they charged they could go and, 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 and uh, hold it on for themselves. And so basically, a tax collector would extort people out of their money. And I don't know about you, but it sounds like a gangster to me. He might have not had a gun, but he probably had a sword or maybe even a bodyguard because he was the chief tax collector. He was the OG of gangsters, okay? He was a gangster that was probably a leader of a gang of other gangsters, all right? This is our man, Zacchaeus. And the Bible says that Zacchaeus was short. I'd say he was actually really short um, because he could not see Jesus through the crowd. And Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus. And so what he does is he, he runs ahead in the, in the same way that Alistair preached uh, last Sunday. It wasn't common for a grown man, particularly a well, uh, a well, a self-made, pretty much rich guy to be running around. And then he climbed the tree. And climbing a tree was even, like, what are you doing? Everyone else is probably like, what is Zacchaeus doing right now? Like, has he gone insane? Because it is already uncommon for us nowadays to see man, grown man, climbing trees. Imagine back in the day where everything, everyone was a bit more conservative and, you know, don't run, you know. You're important enough that whatever you have to run to will wait for you so you, you know, walk. And now, now there's, he's climbing trees. He's like, what are you doing? And Zacchaeus does that because he wants to see Jesus. You see, he did not understand that God's grace and God's love is not earned, but it is freely. He underpriced God's grace. An amazing thing, and this is a beautiful picture of what the gospel is all about. Jesus comes, and there are so many people. He's like the rock star right now. He, people are asking him for autographs and pictures and selfies, and, and, and people are going crazy taking snapshots of Jesus, and he's coming true, and Jesus, from all of that, he looks up at Zacchaeus, and in a way, he said this, Zacchaeus, you don't have to run. You don't have to climb your tree. I come to you, not you come to me. Because before you loved me and before you wanted to see me, 
When you were extorting people out of their money and you were thinking about yourself and you're thinking about your new car and you were thinking about your new home, I was already thinking of you. And I think a lot of times we, we can underprice God's grace and we underprice it in, in, in a few ways. Number one, we think that we're, we're too far gone. That I, I, I had a bit of this when, when, when I struggled with my, with my porn addiction. I just thought to myself, I wasn't, I wasn't enough. I, I knew in a way that God can save me, but I was definitely underpricing His grace because I, don't, I did not fully understand God's grace. And we underpriced that grace. Another way that we underprice our grace, uh, our, God's grace is when we think that other people are too far gone. Imagine if Paul had done that with the jailer. This guy, he's the worst of the bunch. There's no way that he wants to accept Jesus. And we think sometimes that our friends, like, ah, they just wouldn't be interested in, in, in Jesus. Just, just, ah, that person, like, really? Like, they are atheists to the bone. Like, I don't think, I don't think God, I, I, I mean, I think God could probably save him, but he, he would definitely not want it. Imagine if Paul had taught, uh, had taught like that. The jailer was saved because Paul did not underprice God's grace. So don't underprice the power that God's love and God's grace has on other people. Because it's not about you and it's not about the words that you speak. It's about the Spirit of God that lives in you as a Christian and what He will do in a person's heart when they hear the gospel. Yes, it might be that it happens that you say and He laughs in your face and He's going to be like, come on, man. All that Christian stuff, like, just stop with that. He might say that, but you never know if he, He'll be like, man, I really needed to hear that. Tell me more about this God. Tell me more about this grace. You mean I have to? I don't have to do anything. You see, when people truly grasp the love and grace that God has, there is nothing that they could ever do but to surrender to the cross and surrender to His grace. So don't underprice God's grace. And lastly, just to finish up, as I, I don't want to keep you here too long, is we underprice our influence. We underprice our influence. We underprice the influence that we have on other people. We don't realize that even the smallest of acts and the smallest of decisions are going to influence for us and the people around us, particularly the people that are closest to us and then our acquaintances and then people that you don't even know. Big or small, we are influential people. We are influential people. And uh, I love this passage we, that we read. Because, you see, Paul and Silas are in prison. But right there, they made a mistake. They made a mistake. They put them together. You see, Paul was a guy that was a bit more thoughtful, a bit more quiet. He preached the gospel boldly, but he himself was a person that liked to think. He was a person that knew the law a lot. He was a person that liked to study. And in return, he was a bit more downcast. Silas, on the other hand, was, was the opposite. He was a bit more optimistic. And so this is not in the Bible but I want us to like look at this scene from at least my eyes. Have, picture it, right? Paul and Silas, they're in prison, beaten, chained, but they're together. And Paul's like, man, again? Silas, man, we're here again. Another prison, beaten again. At least they didn't torture us this time around. Just beat us and we're done with it. Well, come on, we were, we're preaching the gospel, and it's, what time is it? Like, it must be almost midnight, and still nothing, like, and I just believe that Silas was, started going something like, give me faith. Paul's like, Silas, what are you doing? To trust what you say. Silas, shut up, man, they're going to hear us. That you're good. 
And your love is, come on, Paul, let's sing, let's sing. Silas, come on, man. I'm broken inside. Come on, Paul. Paul's like, I'm giving my life. And Silas like, come on, Paul, do better than that. I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. Come on, Paul, Paul. Our flesh may fail. But my God, you never will. And then they start singing along uh, together. And then the people around them and the prisoners, they begin to listen. And they're like, these people are singing. They sing terribly, but they're singing. And they're praying. And who is this God that, that they're singing about? Who is this God that never fails? Aren't they in prison? Aren't they chained to the ground? What is going on? And then the earthquake happens and people are convicted, not because of the earthquake, but because of what happened before, because of the influence that Silas had on Paul, because of the influence that Silas and Paul had on the other prisoners, because of the influence that they had on the jailer. That is the reason. Yeah, that is the reason. So don't ever underprice the influence that you can have on somebody. No matter how little you think of yourself, please don't. But no matter how little you think that you can make a difference, that you can influence people. A pe person that you don't even know, but she's in church, never underestimate, num never undervalue or underprice the influence that you can have on a person. That your actions can have on a person. That your words can have on a person. Because you see, some people are just stuck in a hole. And God chose you to stretch out your hand and help them out of that place that they're in. Of the hole that they are in. So don't underestimate. You see, the church was made to influence the world. It wasn't made to be within four walls. It wasn't made to sit in the corner of, this, of, the, of the ring. But it was made to be in the center of that ring. Fighting the good fight. Preaching the gospel. Influencing people. It shouldn't be the other people. The world influencing the church. And it shouldn't be the world influencing the world. Or the celebrities. Or anyone like that. But it gotta be us. Us. It has to be us. And, and the moment that we stop underestimating the power of our influence, that is the moment when we will truly change the world. Amen. 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 Don't underestimate your influence. Will you pray with me, church? Lord Jesus. We believe, Lord, that you've spoken here. I pray, Jesus, that everything that the people heard in this place, if it was good, if it was encouraging, if it was helpful, I pray, Jesus, that you'll that you bury it deep in their hearts so that something beautiful may flourish. I pray, Jesus, Lord, that the time that we had in this place may not go to waste. But that people who heard this message may put it into practice. I pray, Jesus, that we will not be like everybody else, but that we will not overprice or underprice the things that we should underprice and overprice. I pray, Jesus, Lord, that we may value, Lord, the things that are worth ha having value and that we may let go of the things that should not be preoccupying us and worrying us and being in our mind, Jesus. I pray for every single person in this place, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will do a miraculous thing in them, Lord. I pray, Jesus, that they will go home and meditate on what they heard. And I pray, Jesus, that above all, they'll put it into practice, Lord, because we know that that is where we built our house on a strong foundation, when it is practice, Jesus. We thank you for this time here in Jesus' name. Amen.